A low rumble shakes the leaves, followed by the rhythmic thumping of giant feet. A small head emerges from the trees, followed by a long neck connected to a large body. Its neck stretches out to graze on something low before rearing up. The creature reaches out with a clawed hand to pull on a branch, bringing the leaves within range of its mouth. The world has never seen a herbivore quite like this before, but eventually these long-necked grazers will occupy every continent and change the course of life on this planet. Welcome to this dinosaur profile on Platyosaurus, the quintessential prosauropod, in the age before true sauropods, the largest land animals around. In 1834, a German doctor called Johann Friedrich Engelhardt discovered a leg bone and some vertebrae at Heraldsburg. Paleontologist Hermann von Meyer named it Platyosaurus Engelharti after the doctor. He did not know it yet, but he had identified Germany's first dinosaur. It wasn't until later that Sir Richard Owen identified dinosaur as a distinct group, and even later that Platyosaurus was added to it. Up until the early 20th century, Platyosaurus fossils would be found in various places in Germany, France and Switzerland. In the 1910s and 1930s, a clay pit near Halberstadt uncovered 39 to 50 skeletons, but at the same time, excavations in Trossingen in the Black Forest were uncovering 35 almost complete skeletons and about 70 others. One German paleontologist called Platyosaurus this. My German is not great, but it basically means the Swabian lindworm or dragon. Unfortunately, museums in the middle of Berlin and Stuttgart were not the safest places for delicate fossils between 1939 and 1945, and most were destroyed. In 1976, a group of almost complete Platyosaurus skeletons were found near Frick in Switzerland. In the 90s, a Platyosaurus was found in Greenland, and a Norwegian oil drill in the North Sea brought up a Platyosaurus bone in a core, making it Norway's first dinosaur too. Now, this wouldn't be a dinosaur profile without something crazy going on. In this case, when von Meyer named the creature Platyosaurus, he included no notes about why he picked this name in particular. And there are a few similar sounding ancient Greek words that the platio could be from. These can translate to paddle, rudder, spade, flat, and broad. Vormir never revealed the etymology of Platyosaurus, but later in a book called This. Basically, this means on the reptiles and mammals from the different time periods of the Earth. He mentions Platyosaurus and its broad, strong limb bones. Because of this, broad lizard is the common translation of Platyosaurus. The rest of the naming history of this dinosaur is described by Yates in 2003 as long and confusing, as if what I just discussed was perfectly straightforward. I will leave it here and just say that at present there are two valid species of Platyosaurus, the original Platyosaurus engelharti and Platyosaurus gracilis. Platyosaurus gracilis was the earlier, smaller species of Platyosaurus. A full-grown P. gracilis would have been about 5 metres long. The later, Platyosaurus engelharti also had full-grown adults about 5 metres long, but there was a lot of variation, with some growing 10 metres long. In discussing Platyosaurus, let's first talk about pose. Platyosaurus has been imagined as a sprawling lizard, a hopping kangaroo-like animal when that was popular, and a simple biped due to its short arms. Generally, in decades past, paleontologists have favoured the hadrosaur approach. It usually walked on four legs, but could run or rear up onto two. In 2010, an exhaustive analysis of Platysaurus's range of movement, link in the description, concluded that not only did Platysaurus not walk on all fours, it could not walk on all fours. Its hands were not able to rotate enough to bear weight. It also turned out that museum displays often swapped the radius and ulna in the arms to properly make it walk on four legs. This sort of thing is not as uncommon as it should be. The weight of Platyosaurus's tail put the centre of mass right over the hips, 
allowing Platysaurus to balance on its two hind legs. This in turn sorts out a problem for the hands, namely those claws. In a quadrupedal pose, these would have to be held off the ground like a dromaeosaur, but now there is no problem, apart from wondering why it had massive claws on its fingers. The main theories are that they were used to hook branches or to defend against predators that weren't put off by its size. Or could be both. Why have one function when you could have two? Next, head. Platysaurus had a small head, probably to put less strain on the neck, but it had a strong bite. The joint where the jaw was attached was lower, to leverage more force without adding extra muscle and weight. The teeth were well suited for eating plants, but the slight cutting edge has led some to think that Platysaurus might have supplemented its diet with carrion. The eyes of Platysaurus were on the side of the head, giving it a wide field of view to spot predators, and they had scleral rings, indicating good night vision. This suggests that Platysaurus was active at various times of the day and night. Now, the neck. This had 10 vertebrae, the same as Thecodontosaurus. The difference was that these vertebrae were longer. This shows option 2 of the Sauropodomorph Guide to Longer Necks. Option 1, have more vertebrae. And option 2, grow longer vertebrae. Option 3, borrow vertebrae from your back, would come later. Why would you need a long neck? Well, it widens your feeding envelope. That is, what you can eat without moving. This is not always the case. Have you ever seen a giraffe have a drink? But Platysaurus's neck, as you can see here, was very flexible. Now another problem is breathing. When you have a long neck, all that air sitting in your airways you are never going to use. When you breathe like a reptile or mammal, you breathe in, gases exchange, and you breathe that air out, pulling in and pushing out of your neck an amount of dead air that never enters the lungs. When you talk about humans, that's not much. But if you're talking about a platysaurus, about 7% of that air would stay in the neck. However, examination of Platysaurus's ribs showed the chest could expand an extra 20 litres, far more for an animal of that size than any mammal, besides deep sea divers such as whales. This capacity is very similar to modern birds, which have a nifty method of breathing. Birds have a system of air sacs, which take up some room inside the bones. Similar gaps have been found in Platysaurus bones. Air sacs behind the lungs draw in air and pump it through the lungs. Air sacs in front of the lungs help draw air through the lungs and expel it from the body. This allows air to constantly pass through the lungs and gas exchange to take place. It is an extremely efficient form of breathing and suggests that Platysaurus was warm-blooded. There is also Platysaurus's belly. Like all dinosaurs, Platysaurus couldn't chew. It snipped off bits of vegetation and swallowed it. Some dinosaurs and some modern birds use gastroliths stones that they swallow and that help grind up plants inside the stomach. While it was thought that Platysaurus used gastroliths, there is no evidence, and based on the amount of material we have, it is likely that they did not. Their gut instead just let the material ferment and gradually break down, releasing a great deal of their nutrients. The legs of Platysaurus were strong and driven by muscles in the tail. Huge muscles pulled the legs backwards, enabling Platysaurus to move relatively quickly, relatively being the key word. Platysaurus could not run. It needed one foot on the ground at all times and sped up by quickening its pace. Now to talk about growth rate. Most warm-blooded animals, like mammals and birds, grow quickly until they are mature and then stop. There is also little variation between full size. Cold-blooded animals, like reptiles, are different. They grow more slowly and keep growing after they are mature until eventually they stop. There is also a lot of variation on how fast they grow and their size when fully grown, based on factors such as availability of food. Platysaurus, though warm-blooded, was a bit of both. It grew quickly, but kept growing through maturity, with variation thought to be due to environment. This is why fully-grown Platysaurus engelharti ranged from 4.8 to 10 metres. This information is from sections through the long bones. When you cut into a thigh bone, for example, there are rings like that of a tree. From the number and size, you can see how old a dinosaur was and how fast it grew. Platysaurus reached maturity at 12, kept growing rapidly until 20, and kept growing slowly. The oldest specimen found was 27. All of this relates to P. Engelharti, as large amounts of them were found. And we've come to talk about feathers already. As I have mentioned, this is a fast-moving area, and a 2019 paper by Benton and others, link in the description, posits that fluff was around in the early Triassic. The switchback to scales, though, was simple and common for dinosaurs over 2 metres long. 
Warm-blooded Platysaurus had enough mass to keep warm without fluffy insulation, and all sauropodomorph skin impressions have been scales. So again, probably no fluff. Platysaurus lived in the late Triassic, between 214 and 204 million years ago. The first species was P. gracilis, from the Lowenstein Formation. The other dinosaur found was Procompsognathus, a little one metre long carnivore. Indicating the environment was Ceratodus, a lungfish. As the name suggests, lungfish have lungs and can breathe air. They live in areas of drought. When the water dries out, they wrap themselves in a cocoon, bury themselves, and breathe air until the water comes back. Then there is the top predator, Teratosaurus, a huge Rausuchian, over 6 metres long. Similar to Saurosuchus and Pososuchus, but bigger. There also may have been the massive mammal-like reptile Lysowishia. I say may because this huge animal has been found from this time period, but in Poland. It may have competed with Platysaurus for food, or filled the same niche of huge herbivore where Platysaurus wasn't around. It was similar to Ischigualastia and Lystrosaurus, but in the manner of Teratosaurus, was bigger. The later P. Englehati is from the Trossingen formation. It shared its environment with the other prosauropod, Ruelia. There are also Terraspondulus, that some think is just the same as Procompsognathus, and the top predator, Lilian sternus, which may or may not have had a crest. We'll find out when someone finds a specimen with the top half of its skull intact. There were also some amphibians and one of the first turtles. When you put these two environments against each other, you can see how the environment niches become dominated by dinosaurs over time. I'm confident that some of you are thinking, what about herds? You said that almost 100 Platysaurus were found in one place. Did they live in giant herds? Well, we don't know. Let me explain. Catastrophic herd events are not uncommon. Flash floods that kill multiple individuals and bury them tend to leave bones strewn around, and are pretty indiscriminate. Places like the Trossingen, Halberstadt and Frick localities have almost whole articulated skeletons of 10 year olds or older. The evidence points to a mud miring trap, similar to the famous La Brea tar pits. Platysaurus was stuck in the mud and trapped. Younger Platysaurus were lighter and did not get stuck or could pull themselves out. Lighter predators tended to leave teeth as they snacked on the parts of the dinosaur sticking out, also accounting for some of the specimens being disturbed. Platysaurus was a large, fast-growing feeding machine. Eventually, sauropodomorph necks and fermenting guts grew so big that they became front-heavy and became quadrupeds. These became the dominant herbivores and eventually grew to become the largest animals to walk the earth. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, show your opinion with a thumbs up and share it with others. Maybe subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. Why not post a comment on what dinosaur you'd like me to do a profile on next? By the way, these are dinosaur profiles. No pterosaurs or marine reptiles need apply. Note, I will not be doing Tyrannosaurus rex in my next profile. I will be doing it eventually, I just want more experience so I can do it justice. If you want to further support this channel, I have a book available on iBooks. It's interactive, has original illustrations, and has a number of interesting dinosaurs in it, including Platysaurus. Link in the description. My next video will be a dinosaur profile on one of the most recognisable dinosaurs around. Stegosaurus. Hope to see you then.